And let's do this. There we go. Okay, chapter 12 is alcohols and phenols. So just like a lot of our chapters, starting with the basics, starting with structures and properties, alcohols contain a hydroxyl group. Now, we got to take a little side step for a second. And actually, I'm going to go just to a blank slide here. We need to talk about the difference between hydroxide and hydroxyl. So when we have an alcohol, we have an OH group attached to it. This is a hydroxyl group, which is part of an alcohol functional group. If we have NaOH, what we really have is a sodium cation and a hydroxide anion. The biggest difference between these two is the fact that this is a covalent bond and this was an ionic bond. The other big difference is that this is neutral and this has a negative charge. I bring this up because not just for the language, not just to know hydroxyl versus hydroxide, but they are very different things. And we spend so much time talking about hydroxide in general chemistry that switching over to hydroxyl and neutral alcohols, your brain has to take a little bit of a switch to make that connection or to, to see it differently. So I just wanna take that second to kind of explain the difference. Um, we do still use hydroxide. We use it as a base in our substitution in our elimination reactions but they are different types of compounds. Okay, let's go back here. So our alcohol contains a hydroxyl group. A phenol well, over here is a benzene ring with an alcohol. So it's just a very specific type of alcohol. Uh, you know, it gets its own name because it's benzene and it has some special properties. Um, the OL is for the alcohol. The phen part, is phenyl, which is um, one of the many names that benzene has. So a little bit of pronunciation difference here. This is phenyl, that's phenol. Not a big difference if we're writing them out, but if we're talking about them, it makes a little bit of a difference. Very abundant in nature. So a couple structures on the bottom down there of THC and CBD. Sorry, I'm grabbing a Kleenex. Um, so they both are phenols. Um, they both have the OH groups attached to benzene rings. I think. Okay, I was trying to remember if that was why I had that blank slide there. Okay, just a second. Okay, I think I'm all better now. Okay, so let's talk about um, some of the other properties and nomenclature. Um, the primary, secondary, and tertiary is the same way that we've looked at halogens. Um, and we'll use the same distinction when we look at with other functional groups as well. So when we're talking about whether the alcohol is primary, secondary, or tertiary, we're talking about that alpha carbon. So the alpha carbon is where our functional group is attached. If it's bonded to one other carbon, it's primary. If it's bonded to two carbons, secondary, and three carbons, tertiary. We know from other chapters that that can affect the, um, affect the reactivity of it, how it's gonna react, what it's going to turn into. And so the same thing is true in this chapter. So we'll use those terms to classify alcohols. And then even when we're talking about reactions, we'll say, well, if it's a primary alcohol, it will turn into this, or if it's secondary, it will turn into this. So we'll use that language a lot in this chapter. Nomenclature. 
same rules. We're looking for the longest parent chain that contains the functional group. We're gonna use the lowest numbers possible, giving priority to that functional group. And we're gonna put everybody in alphabetical order when we start to actually assemble the pieces. We've talked about naming alkenes and alkynes. Alcohols are more important, more important in the sense of naming, naming priority. So the example that's on the bottom down here, we have an alkene on one end of the chain and the alcohol on the other. We put the alcohol at carbon number two because it has a higher priority. There's a whole list of priorities for naming. Um, I've mentioned this before. I will give you that list in the fall semester. Um, we don't really deal with it a whole lot more than just this. I was trying to remember what chapter 13 even is. I think it's ethers. Yeah, in chapter 13, the naming isn't, doesn't really come into play in terms of looking at these priorities. So knowing that alcohols are above alkenes and alkynes is really as far as our priorities go. The suffix that we're going to use is OL. So we've seen this. We've talked about ethanol, methanol, propanol. We haven't actually named anything that way, but we've seen those words pop up. If we have two alcohols, we use diol. And we've seen that reasoning too, because we've seen dienes and dienes. So, you know, it's the same idea. All right, so let me draw a couple out. Let's practice these. And I will do one with an alkene in it as well, or an alkyne. I'm wiping off my screen here. Okay. All right, there's one. And there's another. So in that first one, where should I start numbering it? Right to left. Right to left. Okay. Over here. One, two. Yeah. One, six. Any other options? Anyone want to disagree with that? So the reason why we're not going to use this set of numbers is because, yeah, it's, it doesn't, so in the chat, it doesn't include that alcohol group. So it might actually be the longest chain, but it's not the longest chain with our functional group. So we're going to erase our six numbers here. Try to not erase my chain. And I'm going to start right here. One, two, three, four, five. So our alcohol is on carbon number one. So we're not gonna start at the alcohol because remember we only number our carbons, but we are gonna start right there. So we have a five carbon chain. So we looked for the longest chain that contains our functional group. Okay, so let's see, we have that, we have that, and then we have our two, um, two functional groups. So alphabetically, who's going to come first in our substituents? Ethyl. Yeah, so we're going to say 2-ethyl for methyl. So we have a five carbon chain, so we know it's a pent. We are going to need some numbers. I'm just going to leave a little space there in the front. Um, if it was just an alcohol, we would say pentanol. But that ane right there from the pentane tells us that it's single bonds. So that has to become 
pentene. So we're going to say pentenol. So if we kind of break down the language there, this tells us that we have five carbons. That tells us that we have a double bond. And that tells us that we have the alcohol. So we've included all of the pieces of that parent chain. Now we do need some numbers in the front. So our alcohol is on carbon number one and our double bond starts at carbon number three. And so we want them in that, num in that order, three dash one or three comma one, excuse me. because they're in the same order as the name. And we can break that apart. So we could say three pentene one all, we could say pent three ene one all, or we could keep the name together and put the numbers on the front. Any of those would work. Questions about that name at all? Um, so when we start to add in more functional groups, one of the things that we'll talk about is that we can only use one functional group in the parent chain name, and the rest of them have to become substituents. The one exception to that are alkenes and alkynes, and the reason is because of where they change the name. So because enes and eins are changing the, the ain part of a name, and then something like an alcohol goes on the very end, we can actually combine them together into one word. Um, with everything else we're going to talk about, though, it's always at the very end where the alcohol is. So then we have to pick and choose who gets to be part of the parent chain name and who gets pushed out into a substituent. So we'll look at that with, with um, more functional groups in the fall. Okay, next one. Where are we numbering this one from? Left to right. Left to right. Left to right, perfect. I see it in the chat, I heard it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, what are we starting with? Fluoro. I agree. So we'll say four fluoro. Two methyl. We have a hexane chain with two alcohols attached to it. So my alcohols are at two and three. So two, three. Any Thoughts on what our parent name will be? Any guesses? Is it hexadiol? It is. It's hexandiol. Um, you, you might also see it written without the N, so hexadiol. I actually don't remember off the top of my head which one is like the official proper way, but it, I know whichever one is the official proper way, it does get used both ways, so with or without that N. I think we say it like this, hexadiol, which probably means that the N is the proper way to write it. And the other way has just kind of been adapted because of how we pronounce it. But either way would be okay. Um, we can also break this up and put the numbers in the middle. So we could say hexan two, three, dial. Not as common to do it that way because there's only one functional group, um, but it would not be wrong. Questions about that one? Okay. Wait, can you start? Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. Can you explain the, the AN part of the hexane? <laughs> yeah. So I think that with the N is like the official proper way to do it. Uh -huh. But a lot of times when we say it, we don't pronounce the N. So we just say hexadiol. And so because of that, it's also become common to spell it without the N. 
So either one would be okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So a little bit more property stuff. We know that alcohols are really good at hydrogen bonding. And so that's going to make their boiling point higher than what we might expect or higher than something with a similar structure. So the differences here, ethane, chloroethane versus ethanol. So we have something that's completely nonpolar, something that's polar. So it will have our dipole dipole forces, dipole dipole, and then something that has hydrogen bonding. So essentially we're kind of moving up the chain of um, what type of intermolecular forces they can have. And as we do that, the boiling points get higher and higher. So our alcohols have higher boiling points than what we might expect them to for something of that size. This is the reason why if you have a bottle of vodka in your freezer, it doesn't actually become solid. It has a much lower freezing point than water. And so it stays liquid or maybe even a little bit slushy. Water solubility, and this is something that we looked at, it feels kind of like forever ago, but in the one lab where we looked at solubility, one of my, my kind of hints to tell you guys when, when you were looking at the data was size, size of the molecules. When we have a, an alcohol, we have a carbon portion, which is nonpolar, and we have the alcohol portion, which is polar. And so this part, the polar part, will be soluble in water, and the nonpolar part won't be. And so that's why they're listed as hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So water loving and water fearing. So really just, you know, which ones would mix with water, which ones would be miscible or soluble with water. And so how many carbons there are will determine if it's water soluble or not. If we have three carbons or less, then it's water soluble. So that means that the hydrophilic portion is, um, kind of the dominating portion. And if we have four carbons or more, then it's going to not be soluble in water because that carbon portion is the dominating force. So propanol, ethanol, methanol are all water soluble. And then when we hit butanol, pentanol, so on, those would not be water soluble. Questions about that? Reaction number one. Um, the way that this chapter is presented at the end of the book, so where there's normally like a nice little map, a nice reaction summary, it's not presented the same as the other chapters. So I am giving them reaction numbers, um, but they aren't from the book. The book doesn't have them numbered this time. So I have them numbered just to kind of keep myself organized, and they're based on the like the categories that, that the book puts them in, but just so you know, they are my numbers this time. So we're starting with a deprotonation reaction. Um, and we've seen this, we've seen RO minus used in different reactions as a nucleophile, as, as a base. And so we have to kind of talk about where, where to get that from. So it is a base, um, which means to, remove that hydrogen from the alcohol in order to create this base, we have to use a very strong base to do this. So we have to think about that whole acid base equilibrium. We're making a base. It has to be weaker than the base we started with. The stronger one is pushing the reaction forward. So we talked about this in our last chapter with acids. The same thing's happening here with bases. So what it really means is that we just have to use a really strong base. And the strong base that we're going to use for this is sodium hydride. Oh, the name is already down there. I don't need to rewrite it. It's right here. So sodium hydride is a sodium cation and a hydrogen anion. So that's why it's called a hydride. So it's a hydrogen with a lone pair, giving it a negative charge, which is going to be very basic. That's a very unhappy hydrogen. But here's the mechanism for this. And what's really nice about this is the other product that forms. So our hydride is gonna grab onto that hydrogen 
the electrons go onto the oxygen. So we make our RO minus, oh, this is called an alkoxide, by the way. I know I've said that word before, but there it is again. So it's an alkyl group with an oxygen that is negatively charged. So that's telling you that it's carbon, so it's an alkyl. That's telling you that there's an oxygen. And then the ide tells you that it's negative. So again, the name is nicely descriptive. Um, we have a sodium cation there, don't really care about him. But the two hydrogens that come together make hydrogen gas. The little up arrow is telling us that that gas is bubbling away and it leaves our solution, which is super nice because notice the reaction arrow, it's not an equilibrium arrow, it's only going forward because we're using Le Chatelier's principle to our advantage. As that product leaves, as hydrogen gas bubbles away, it's pushing the reaction forward to make more product. So even though this would be in equilibrium if we kept it contained, if we kept it in a closed container, we can leave that container open, let that gas bubble away and use that to our advantage. There's one other way to do this. The other way is to use one of our alkali metals. So sodium, lithium, or potassium. So there's our alcohol, there's our metal, we will make our negatively charged oxygen and we're still going to make hydrogen gas. Um, this is using some radical mechanisms. The reason we're using an alkali metal is because they all have one lone pair electron. And so we're using that to our advantage. So I was gonna write this out kind of in a little generic version for us. So if we write it as ROH, NAH, RO negative, or ROH. I'm just going to put an M for metal, RO negative, and then we can say our metal is sodium, lithium, or potassium. So there's our generic version of our first reaction. Um, this would not be like the end of the reactions. What I mean by that is we're not gonna to wanna to end with a negatively charged oxygen. The purpose of this would be then to use it in another reaction, to use it as a nucleophile or a base in one of our substitution or elimination reactions. Um, we don't wanna end with a negatively charged oxygen. So it's, it's essentially kind of a starting point. Questions about this first one at all? There's no stereochemistry or regiochemistry to talk about because it's just the hydrogen that's on the oxygen. We're not making any stereo center, so not a whole lot there. Okay. So before we talk about the rest of the reactions, we are going to talk about alcohols as acids. So in order to do this reaction, that's essentially what we're treating it as. So this is my acid, and this is my base, and this is my conjugate base, and this is my conjugate acid. So we're going to look at our alcohols as acids and what would make them stronger or weaker. And it's stuff we know. It's ARIO. Um, but not all alcohols are going to be at the same acidity levels. So we have three things here that will change whether they are stronger than what we're comparing them to or weaker than. And I worded it kind of weird there because none of them are strong acids. They're not HCLs and phosphoric acids, but they might be stronger than their neighbor. So the first one is resonance. So notice our pKa differences there. Cyclohexanol is 18, phenol is 10. So it's a difference of eight, but remember this is a logarithmic scale. So it's a difference of 10 to the power of eight. So what is that, 10 million? I might be off, might be 100 million, I don't know. I can never move the decimal right in my head the first time. But the reason why phenol is so much more acidic is because it has a much more stable conjugate base. So that, if this is our acid, that's our conjugate base. And the reason why it's so stable is because it has five, that was not supposed to be a radical arrow. Let me fix that, there we go. Um, 
it's going to have five resonance contributors. So it has all of this dispersion of that negative charge, all of these atoms to share that negative charge with, making it much more stable. That is why phenols kind of get their own listing in the title, because they are going to have different types of reactivity, because that hydrogen is easier to remove. It's a more acidic hydrogen. The next one on the list is induction. So that's going right here. And if you remember all the way back to chapter three, induction is when we have electronegative groups nearby. So we have ethanol, pK of 16, trichloroethanol. So now we have three chlorines attached, pK of 12.2. So a difference of about four. So 10 to the fourth difference in their acidity levels. Reason why is the conjugate base for this guy, we have that negative charge on that oxygen, just like ethanol would, but all of these chlorines are going to be pulling that negative charge, pulling those electrons towards it, not through resonance arrows, not through the bonds, but through that electron cloud. So they help to spread out that negative charge, spread out those electrons, making it more stable. And then the last one, which is one we did talk about, but we definitely didn't spend as much time on it. We're gonna go up and over here, is solvation. And solvation refers to how much the solvent can surround the alcohols or surround whatever molecule it is we're talking about. Um, and a lot of times we are talking about water, but that's not always the case. So with the two examples that are here, if we have their conjugate bases, you know, they're both carbon groups. They both have negatively charged oxygens on them. One of the things that can help stabilize a negatively charged oxygen is the solvent that's around it. So if we have water molecules, the hydrogens are gonna be attracted to those oxygens. Water molecules can surround this one fairly easily, but because the other one has that large sterically hindered tert butyl group, it isn't as easy to surround. So because of that, the smaller group, the one that has less branching is going to be more acidic than the bulkier one that is more sterically hindered. So the difference there of two, so our ethanol is a hundred times more acidic than our tert butanol just because the solvent can surround it better. So the solvent is helping to stabilize it and um, essentially share that charge or minimize that charge. Questions? Okay. There are a couple slides, or wait, maybe just one slide, one slide of review. So when we look at our functional groups, we often look at how to prepare them and then how to react to them. So section 12.3 is how to prepare our alcohols, but we've already talked about this. So we have substitution reactions. So we're starting with an alkyl halide. We're reacting it with our OH group and we can turn that into an alcohol. And we have the difference between primary versus tertiary. That's just whether or not it's gonna take an SN1 or SN2 path and whether we're going to have a negatively charged nucleophile or a neutral nucleophile. But this is chapter seven. I was looking down at the bottom to see if it was also seven, but it's not. That's chapter eight. And then the other way that we know how to make alcohols is starting with an alkene. So using our addition reactions, we had adding acid and water or using the mercury version. These are both Markovnikov reactions. The difference between them, this one can do carbocation rearrangements, which might be good, might be bad, depending on what you're trying to make. And then the last one there with the boron, this is an anti-Markovnikov reaction. So we can add on that alcohol to either the most substituted or the least substituted, depending on which pathway we're trying to, trying to do. So 
reminders of ways we've already learned how to make these alcohol groups. Any, any questions on the, on the old reactions here? One of the ways that the reactions are divided up or put into categories in this chapter is whether we are, and actually this isn't even just for this chapter, this is kind of the way we look at it in a lot of chapters, but we look at them whether it's a reduction reaction or an oxidation reaction. And so we're going to look at both sides in this chapter. We're gonna look at how to make an alcohol through a reduction reaction. And so the example that's down here is starting with a ketone and turning it into an alcohol. So this is a reduction reaction. So there's no reagents here, right? You know, we haven't learned how to actually do this yet. It's just showing you what a reduction reaction would look like. And one of the things we learn in general chemistry is that whenever we have a reduction, we also have an oxidation. We don't generally refer to them as reduction reactions or oxidation reactions we refer to them as redox reactions. We put the two together. The reason why we only refer to them as one way or the other is we don't care about everybody else. We care about that carbon. So when we say that something is being, or when we say a reaction is a reduction reaction or an oxidation reaction, we're referring to the carbon that's in the middle of everything. And that's it. We're, as organic chemists, we have, very tight blinders on and we only pay attention to what's going on with the carbon. And so the oxidation states or oxidation numbers kind of depends on what book you used and who you learned it from, but they do mean the same thing. So you learned a whole list of rules on how to calculate oxidation numbers. Um, this, is, this is kind of the range for carbon. So we go from negative four when it's attached to four hydrogens all the way to positive four when it's bonded, double bonded to two oxygens. So if we're going this direction, that would be oxidizing our carbon. And if we go in this direction, this would be reducing. So we're going to be starting with oxygens that are double bonded to carbon and reducing them down to a single bond, reducing them down to alcohols. And then we will also look at how to react our alcohols, oxidizing and turning them back into those double bonds. Okay, questions about this? I hope I didn't make that confusing. Okay. So reaction number two. So in reaction number two, we're starting with a ketone or an aldehyde. We're reacting it with hydrogen gas and a metal catalyst. So our metal catalyst options here, platinum, palladium, or nickel. And it turns that carbon oxygen double bond into a carbon oxygen single bond. So essentially we're adding a hydrogen to the oxygen and we're adding a hydrogen to the carbon. Um, so we've, we've seen this reaction before. We've started with an alkene and turned it into an alkane, or we started with an alkyne and turned it into an alkane. So we're doing the same thing here, but we're doing it with a carbon oxygen double bond. Uh, so question in the chat was, whether or not you have to memorize these numbers or know how to calculate them, note about those questions. So this was just kind of a demonstration of showing you the different levels of oxidation for carbon and the, all the ranges, but you do not need to know these actual numbers. If what you would need to know is that if I gave you this and this, you would need to know that this one is more oxidized. And we know that because it has more bonds to oxygen. So that's the easiest way to look at this in terms of carbon. How many bonds to oxygen does it have? So this one doesn't have any. One, two, three, four. We're increasing our bonds to oxygen. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
perfect. I'm looking at my notes to see. Oh, um, so regiochemistry, it's only reacting with the carbonyl carbon and the oxygen. Stereochemistry, if we make a new stereocenter, it will be racemic. So if we start with a ketone, let's see, I'm gonna erase this on the bottom and write it out a little bit different. If we start with a ketone, we're going to get a secondary alcohol. And if we start with an aldehyde, we will get a primary alcohol. So we have a ketone example on here. Let me give you a quick example of a aldehyde. And you erase my alkyne and alkene up here. So there's my aldehyde, some hydrogen, some platinum. I kept the hydrogen there just because we had it there for the aldehyde. Definitely doesn't have to be there. But we go from our aldehyde to our primary alcohol. Any questions on that first reaction? Yeah, so I can't really see the like the last part that you wrote down there. So it says ketone and then two per uh, two degree uh, or it goes. So the ketone creates a secondary alcohol. And the aldehyde creates a primary alcohol. Uh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. And this one is kind of easy to see that the, um, that the ketone is gonna form a secondary carbon, but what if it's not cyclic? Okay, let me show you an example without a cyclic one. Thank you. All right, there's our ketone. Hydrogen, we'll do nickel down there just to be different this time. There we go, just like that. So same thing. So it's just that that double bond turns into a single bond. So whether it's cyclic or on the chain. And so the way that I just drew it is I did create a stereocenter. So we would actually get, we'll do a wedge. We'll do a dash just to kind of show that it's racemic for sure. But we would get those as our products. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? So we're going to have a few ways to do this same idea, to do this reduction reaction. Um, so the second way we're doing it is through a hydride reaction. So we already saw what hydride was. We saw hydride is a negatively charged hydrogen. So in this reaction, we're starting with, again, a ketone or an aldehyde. And we're going to see that a lot where we kind of pair things together. We're reacting it with sodium borohydride. So NaBH4 is sodium borohydride. The sodium is our positive cation. Don't really care about him. The borohydride is a boron bonded to four hydrogens. It has a negative charge. Boron gets used a lot for us because it normally wants three bonds. That's what makes it happy, makes it neutral, but it it doesn't have a full octet. So it has space to take on an extra bond and an extra pair of electrons, even though it's going to give it a negative charge. So we essentially use that to our advantage by forcing it to take on this extra hydrogen that it really now just wants to get rid of. So our borohydride just looks like that. Um, underneath the arrow is our solvent. So we do need to have a protic solvent. 
So remember that means one that can do hydrogen bonding. So our options here, water, ethanol, methanol, you only need one of them. There is an or there, but you need one of them so that we can have that hydrogen. We have the mechanism down here. So that hydride is going to act as a nucleophile. So our first step is a nucleophilic attack. So look at where this arrow is starting. It's starting at the electrons and doing a nucleophilic attack on that carbonyl carbon. And so by starting at that bond, that's why we can call it a hydride because the hydrogen is taking those electrons with it. And so that hydrogen has that negative charge to take those electrons. And then the pi electrons go onto that oxygen as a lone pair right here. So we end up with this as our intermediate. Uh, and the only thing that's left to do is to add on the hydrogen onto that oxygen to make it neutral again. So notice what we're using here. We're using water, but that could have been ethanol. It could have been methanol but we're just doing a proton transfer. We're grabbing onto that hydrogen. So proton transfer. And so that our oxygen ends up neutral. So the example that's above in, with the cyclic is starting with a ketone. And just like in our last reaction, if we start with a ketone, we're going to make a secondary alcohol. If we start with an aldehyde, we're gonna make a primary alcohol. So get rid of this hydride up here. So there's my aldehyde. If I use sodium borohydride and some ethanol. Actually, I'm going to do it here just to make it a little bigger. I will get that. And then there's my other hydrogen that got added on just to show both of them that will make that primary alcohol. Um, regiochemistry, there's only two atoms that are involved. So it's that carbonyl carbon and that carbonyl oxygen. Stereochemistry, if we do make a new stereocenter, it will be racemic. The reason why it's racemic, so the last one and this one, is because what we're starting with is a trigonal planar carbon. And so that first reaction can happen on the front side or the back side. And so we, if we start from the front, we will create one of the stereoisomers. And if we react on the back, we'll make the other stereoisomer. So we will get both, both options there. Questions about that at all? Okay, we have one more in this category and then we will look at some practice ones or I will put up some practice ones. Let's see, I'm also checking our time. I haven't looked at it in a while. Oh, I'm knocking things over, my goodness. Okay, oh, we're fine on time. All right, so fourth reaction, last one in this group is Again, we're still looking at reductions and we're using lithium aluminum hydride this time. So notice the name, we still have hydride in there. We still have that negatively charged hydrogen. Lithium aluminum hydrogen. So we're gonna have a lithium cation. Again, just like the sodium, we don't care about it. Aluminum hydride. We're gonna have an aluminum bonded to four hydrogens. Now. If I can find my periodic table over here, there it is. What these all have in common, borons right here, aluminum's right underneath it. So they're in the same column on the periodic table, which means they have a lot of the same properties. One of which being, they only want three bonds. They're happy with having an unfilled octet. With both of these reagents, we're forcing them to take on that extra bond 
which now makes it want to get rid of that hydrogen with its electrons. So we're using the same reactivity ideas and properties in both of these reactions. So we can have a list of things. And actually, let me look. Okay. Um, I had a, couldn't remember what I had on the next slide. So this is shown with an aldehyde. But we can do this reaction with a ketone, with an aldehyde, with a carboxylic acid, or with an ester. If we start with a ketone, we will make a secondary alcohol. If we start with an aldehyde, a carboxylic acid, or an ester, we will make a primary alcohol. So I have an example of an ester on the next slide. Um, I will add a carboxylic acid to that because they're going to be very similar. We have an aldehyde right here. Let me put a ketone up here for you. So ketone, that first step is lithium aluminum hydride. So we abbreviate it as LAH, lithium aluminum hydride. Nice, easy abbreviation. Um, if you we were to write it out as a chemical formula, it'd be LIALH4. Obviously just as good because it has the full formula, but LAH is definitely going to be the most common way to see it. Step number two is water. So notice these are two separate steps that is important. And what we would get from this would be that secondary alcohol. So starting with our ketone, we make a secondary alcohol. Okay, let's look at the mechanism for this one. It's going to look just like the last one. So it's, it's a hydride. And so the way it's reacting is going to be super similar. We're starting from the electrons of that aluminum hydrogen bond, and we're doing a nucleophilic attack on that carbonyl carbon. So this would be the same first step, no matter which starting group we're starting with. So whether it's an aldehyde, a ketone, carboxylic acid or ester. Now for the carboxylic acid and the ester, the rest of the steps are going to be a little bit different and we're going to see those on the next slide, but that first step's the same. The double bond becomes a lone pair on the oxygen. And so then our intermediate again looks very similar to what we saw on the on the last reaction. And so we're going to use the water to protonate. We're doing a proton transfer so that we end up with that neutral oxygen. So this right here is our mechanism for ketones and aldehydes. So the only difference between whether we're using a ketone or an aldehyde is this R group right here. I'll just circle it all the way through. That will be an R group if it's a ketone. It will be a hydrogen if it's an aldehyde. Um, let's see, what else? Regiochemistry, not really any, because again, we're just working with the carbonyl. Stereochemistry, same as the others, meaning if we make a new stereocenter, it will be racemic. Questions about that first, first mechanism for this one? Okay, so let's look at the ester mechanism. Uh, and so this is shown with an ester. I'm going to draw the carboxylic acid version down here, just so you have an example. Actually, let's put the abbreviation. So starting with our carboxylic acid, we will make a primary alcohol if we go through this reaction. Okay, so let's look at this mechanism. Um, really, we're just kind of doing the same thing twice. So that first step's the same. We're doing a nucleophilic attack from that hydrogen and pi bond becomes a lone pair, so a nucleophilic attack. We get this intermediate. Now what happens here is because we have the OR group, if we have an ester or an OH group, if we have a carboxylic acid, 
it's a it's a decent leaving group. So we're going to kick off that leaving group and the carbon oxygen double bond just reforms. So loss of a leaving group and we're going to reform that carbonyl. And so we end up with an aldehyde intermediate. We can't stop it at the aldehyde though. This is going to continue to react. We can't stop and collect that aldehyde as our product. It doesn't work that way. Lithium aluminum hydride is too reactive. And so it continues to continue to react. When we look at our aldehyde and ketone chapter in the fall, we will talk about how to, to stop it at that point. It will require different reagents though. And so now that we're at the aldehyde, it's going to react in the same way we've already seen. We're going to take our lithium aluminum hydride, do another nucleophilic attack. And now we have those two hydrogens added on. So the two red hydrogens are what we got from the lithium aluminum hydride. We're going to use our water then, that second step water, to grab onto that hydrogen so that we end up with our primary alcohol. So the reason why it's primary is because we're adding on those two hydrogens from the lithium aluminum hydride. And so we only have that one R group attached to it. Questions about this side of the reaction, this mechanism at all? Let me draw out a couple practice ones for us then, some boxes to fill in. It's a little box. So on the right-hand side, they look the same, but we're just gonna add a little note here that just says two different ways. Okay, and I do have the screen annotation on. So feel free to fill in a box with some reagents.
So I'm going to start down in the left corner just because I think that one was done first. So we have an aldehyde and we're turning it into a primary alcohol. And I keep emphasizing or talking about, you know, what functional group is turning into what functional group um, because it can be a really helpful way to remember the reagents. Um, you know, when you do the multi-step synthesis or even the box problems, you have this whole list of reagents in your head and, and having them memorized for one chapter might be okay. But then when you go on and now you're tacking on all these new chapters, it's, it's easy to get them lost in the mix. So thinking of them in terms of, okay, if I wanna start at a primary alcohol and I wanna turn it into a carboxylic acid, you should have kind of an idea or list of reagents. Another way to kind of group them for organizing them is to think about them as either reducing agents or oxidizing agents. Yeah. If that doesn't help, that's completely okay, but it is a common way to categorize them. Okay, get off my little side, my side road there. Um, so this, the one on the bottom left, we have lithium aluminum hydride and water definitely is gonna work. We're gonna add on numbers though, just to say that these are two separate steps, but the reagents themselves are good. And then the one above it, we have our carboxylic acid turning into a primary alcohol. And I see aluminum hydride there. So I'm going to assume that's lithium aluminum hydride. And same story, we just need a one and a two there, but it's good. Um, and then going over to our ketone and turning that into a secondary alcohol, we have hydrogen and our catalyst definitely works. Instead of platinum, we could have had palladium or nickel just to show you what the other options are, but platinum does the job. And then with that down arrow, our ketone is turning into the same secondary alcohol, but with a new way to do it. And we have sodium borohydride and water. And again, instead of water, we could have had methanol or ethanol just as other options there, or maybe you did it slightly different. And then really we could have a third way for this, we could have our lithium aluminum hydride and the water. So starting with our ketone or our aldehyde, we have three different ways to do the same reaction. Um, starting with our esters and our carboxylic acids, we have one way. Questions about any of the boxes? Okay. Oh yeah, I gotta, um, I'm going to erase our annotation. Any, anyone wanna stop me before I do it for pictures or anything? Okay. There we go. Um, this is, I, I always, I kind of think this is kind of a weird section of the, uh, of the book. So it's section 12.5, preparation of diols. So we just did preparation of alcohols. This is preparation of diols. So really it's saying if you're starting with a ketone or an aldehyde, we have these three different ways that we just talked about on how to make a diol. So really it's saying if you have two ketones, two aldehydes, a ketone and an aldehyde in the same structure, and you react it with one of these sets of reagents, both of them will reduce down to an alcohol. It's essentially what this is saying. And then the other one that's on here is starting with an alkene. We know how to make diols. This is going back to chapter eight. So we can do syn or anti-addition using our different reagents that we've talked about. So we have our Peroxy acid, our most common one that we've used, MCPBA, acid and water, and then we have OSO4, so osmium tetraoxide, NMO. I know we talked about KMNO4 and some other reagents to go along with that. There's kind of a whole list for that one, but those are some of the examples of it. So kind of a weird section, but it's really just showing how to how to get dials on a on a structure. The next way we're going to make alcohols is through a reaction called a Grignard reaction. Um, so 
this guy, Victor Grignard. Um, he won the Nobel Prize for coming up with this back in 1912. So anytime there's a Nobel Prize associated with a reaction, you know it's a big deal. You know it's, it kind of broke some, some ground. Um, and so the reaction that's on the top here is how to make a Grignard reagent. So we're starting with an alkyl halide. Normally it's bromine. So our X can be bromine. It can also be chlorine, but bromine is going to be much more common for this. We're going to react it with magnesium and it has to be magnesium. No other options here. What happens is the magnesium gets inserted between the carbon and the halogen. So there's a couple examples down here on the bottom. We have a benzene ring attached to a bromine, and now we have MgBr. We have this propane with a chlorine, and now we have MgCl. The reason, oh, and those are the Grignard reagents. So once that magnesium is attached, we now refer to it as a Grignard reagent. Uh, this is also kind of the start of our of some of the named reactions. There's a lot of reactions that are named after the chemists that they were developed by or figured out by, and we still call them by whatever name that was. Um, I definitely prefer calling things a hydrohalogenation or an oxidation because it tells you what's happening, but these aren't things we can ignore. Um, this is how they are referred to. There's even like reference books that are called named reactions and it's just the reactions that have been named after people so it's that common all right the reason why this is important the reason why this is going to kind of change things is and i'm going to use this propane as an example is when we have that carbon magnesium bond it's really a bond between a metal and a non-metal and so we end up with a very strong partial positive and very strong partial negative charge. And we know that when a metal and a nonmetal form a bond, it's usually an ionic bond. And so normally it's full charges. So oftentimes we don't even think of this as partial charges. We're going to think of it as a carbanion and a magnesium chloride or magnesium bromide cation. And so really the purpose of this Grignard reagent is to create a carbanion because now we have a carbon that is a strong nucleophile and a strong base. We've created a carbon that can now go react with other carbons. And we've had very few reactions that make new carbon-carbon bonds. The only one we've had is in chapter nine, when we had our alkyne and we added an alkyl group to it. That's the only time we've been able to add a carbon group. This is now going to be the next time we do it, which is why I was going to call him Mr. I'm sure he was a doctor though. Dr. Grignard here got the Nobel Prize because it is such a big deal to make those carbon-carbon bonds. So here's how we use the Grignard reagent. We haven't even talked about the actual reaction yet. So this is reaction number five, our Grignard reaction. We can start again with three different things. We can start with a ketone, an aldehyde, or an ester. Carboxylic acid is not on this list, and we'll talk about why in a minute. If we start with a ketone, which is what's shown here, we're going to make a tertiary alcohol. If we start with an ester, actually, let me put that to the side right here. If we start with an ester, we would also make a tertiary alcohol. And if we start with an aldehyde, we will make a secondary alcohol. So we have to have one of those functional groups. Notice that this is in two steps. So the first step is our Grignard reagent. Now, depending on how this problem is presented to you, you know, a box problem on the test or a problem that you're practicing out of the book or on the worksheet, you might have to make the Grignard reagent. So we might have to start with an R group with our halogen, react it with magnesium to make this. 
or it might be given to you in the problem already made as a Grignard reagent. So that reaction on the last slide is kind of like the prerequisite to reaction number five. It's the prequel to number five. Um, and it might be needed and it might not be needed. It kind of just depends on how the reaction's presented. Second step, water. So the mechanism is down here on the bottom. Let's see, regiochemistry, it's only happening at the carbonyl. Stereochemistry, racemic. So if we make a stereocenter, it will be a racemic mixture. Same reasons as all the others. When we have that trigonal planar carbonyl carbon, our group can attack from either side, giving us both stereoisomers. Now, the mechanism for this is going to look very similar to the hydride mechanisms. Here is our negatively charged R group. So I'm gonna go back one slide. That's this. So it's the R group from the Grignard reagent. We're treating it as an anion. It has such a strong partial positive, excuse me, partial negative charge that we can treat it as an anion and we're completely just ignoring the magnesium and, and the halogen. So we have our negatively charged R group. We're gonna do a nucleophilic attack on that carbonyl carbon, the pi electrons become a lone pair. We get our intermediate here. So the only thing left to do is add a hydrogen to that oxygen. So that's where our water comes in. We do a proton transfer and we get our alcohol. So in this case, in this example, we have a ketone and we're ending with a tertiary alcohol. So because we're adding on that third R group, a ketone already has two R groups. So we're adding on that third R group. That's why it becomes a tertiary alcohol. I'm looking at my notes here. If we did this with an aldehyde, this is our mechanism for ketones and aldehydes, by the way. Um, if we did this with an aldehyde, what I just circled there, all of those would just be hydrogens. So instead of an R group, it would be a hydrogen. And so an aldehyde has one R group attached to it. We're adding a second one. That's how it becomes the secondary alcohol. Let's talk for a second about why we can't use carboxylic acids for this. Um, it's also the same reason why water is added in in a second step. So if we have a carboxylic acid and we're going to try and react it with this negatively charged R group, what would happen is that R group is just going to steal that hydrogen. This is the same reason why the water can't be in there. It would react with the water before it reacted with our ketone or our aldehyde. So we can't have any acidic hydrogens present. This is actually so reactive with water that when you do this reaction, it has to be in a sealed container so that it's not exposed to any water in the air. Um, and this is one of the reactions that when we do it in person, we actually have to put our glassware in the oven the day before. And so it dries out completely. So if the glass has absorbed any water, we are heating it out, we're evaporating it out in the oven. And then the day of the reaction, you take your glassware out of the oven, let it cool down to room temperature, and then you can do the reaction. Um, and even when you're letting it cool, you're, you need to put it in a desiccator so it doesn't absorb any water as it's cooling. Um, it's not like dangerous or explosive or anything if it touches water, it just kills the reagent and, or the other, the more official word we would use is that it quenches the reaction. And so by adding in that water in that second step, we are reacting any Grignard reagent that's still left over. So we're quenching the reaction, we're stopping the reaction, and we're adding hydrogens to all of those oxygens. So down here. This tells us why we can't use carboxylic acids for this reaction. 
no acidic hydrogens around the Grignard reagent. Okay, but there's one mechanism we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about the ester. So I'm gonna draw that one out for you. So this is our Grignard reaction mechanism for our ester. Okay, there's my ester. We're gonna react this with ethyl magnesium bromide and water. Um, let's see. I'm gonna write my ethyl out this way because just writing it as like a little stick doesn't quite look right. So there's my ethyl group, there's my ester. I'm gonna do a nucleophilic attack and the pi bond becomes a lone pair. So, so far looks very similar. Okay, so that's what we have. We've added on the new ethyl group. We have our negatively charged oxygen and we still have the OR group of the ester. And so this is going to be similar to when we saw esters and carboxylic acids react with lithium aluminum hydride. What I mean by that is we're going to have a loss of a leaving group. That pi bond is going to reform and we're going to have the loss of a leaving group of the OR group, the OR group that's attached to our ester. So that's the part of my ester that was original. There's the ethyl group that we added on in the first step. We're just going to do the same thing again. So when we have an ester, it's going to react twice. Just like, I'm going to go back a bunch of slides here. Right here, when we start with an ester or a carboxylic acid, it goes through this step, that lithium aluminum hydride step twice, because it's reforming that carbonyl. We're doing the same thing with our Grignard reagent that carbonyl reforms, we're gonna do another nucleophilic attack. So now I've added on two of those ethyl groups. So we are making a tertiary alcohol. Two of the R groups will be the same. So when we're starting with an ester, we won't ever make a racemic, or excuse me, we won't ever make a stereocenter because two of those R groups are going to be from the Grignard reagent. And so it won't ever have a stereocenter. Well, at least not where the carbonyl is. There might be like something over here that makes it into a stereocenter, but we're not creating a stereocenter. All right, last step, the water comes into play. There's my water. We're gonna do a proton transfer. Oxygen grabs that hydrogen. So my final product. I'm gonna draw it a little weird, starting right there. That's the portion of my ester that was original. So the three carbon chain on the left, the carbon and the oxygen that were part of the carbonyl. And then we added on two ethyl groups. So it went from being an ester to being a tertiary alcohol. Questions about that mechanism at all? Do we, no. So the question in the chat was, do we always add ethyl? Definitely not. So this can be a lot of different things. So even in one of the examples back here, it could even be a benzene ring. Um, really the only limitation is that it can't have an OH group on it. It can't have any acidic hydrogens on, on the Grignard reagent, but it can be primary, secondary, tertiary, benzylic. Um, so it can be a lot of different things, which means Oops, sorry, too far. Here we go. 
um, as we're doing multi-step synthesis, if we need to add on a bigger group, we can use these Grignard reagents and add on a lot of carbons at a time. So it becomes quite handy. Any other questions? If we are starting with an ester, we are adding the same group twice. So we couldn't add like an ethyl and then add a propyl. It has to be two of the same groups. That might be a limitation. Okay, one more topic. Let's see. Hmm. What time is it? 10.03? I feel like this is, our last topic is like five slides or our next topic is, I think it's too much to get into in our last five minutes of class. So we will start on Monday talking about how to protect alcohol groups, which sounds kind of weird, but that's what we'll do. So um, we'll start there. I'll hang out here and answer any questions you might have, but we will talk about reaction number or experiment number, I think we're on 11 today. My notes are down here somewhere for it. Yeah, experiment number 11. Um, but that is all for today. So I will see you guys in lab, see you guys in office hours, see you on Monday, whenever you show up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, guys.